<laughs> it's a good morning this morning. <laughs> Them songs just got me. I'm sitting there. I'm still emotional. And then you're talking about the woman with the issue of blood. I'm thinking just how loving Jesus is. I mean, I'm just so moved. I, just the fact, don't get, don't get familiar with all that. Like the fact that he's God and he's on the earth <laughs> as a man. He comes to, to restore what man failed and give back what God intended. Like the fact that he came, like I'm like, I'm just a little moved. I don't even know what we're going to do. We might be, we might be in trouble because, <laughs> uh, man, that worship was amazing. The songs, the songs were just so worshipful, so honorable, so exalting of God and who He is. And, and He is, He's so beautiful. And the Bible says, see the Bible says that you won't love Him unless you see His first love. I, I really was sitting there, I was overwhelmed and I'm thinking, you know, the name of God is so skewed on the earth and people's view of God, there's a, the, people look at God a hundred different ways. But if you don't see Him for who He really is, your heart won't respond the way it's designed to respond. And I believe that's why his name's so profane. I believe that's why he's so mixed up. I believe the enemy's plan is to get us to see God outside of who he really is. Because when you see him for who he is, when we see him as he is, I know John's talking about that day, and, 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 but, but it's still a truth. When you see him as he is, we'll be like him. And there's just this blindness to try to keep you. Like people have such a wrong impression of God. And even growing up young, people early on get this right out of the gate wrong impression of God. And, and just because their daddy was a certain way and they call him father and then he's called father, then they make some connection and they somehow think somehow that has something to do with something. And honestly, it has nothing to do with nothing. He's the Lord. <laughs> Look, you can have the most messed up daddy and you call him father and then we call God father. He's, well, I have a hard time relating to father because of my father. Stop that. Stop relating it. It has nothing to do with each other. You find God through His Son. You don't find God through your dysfunctional memory. It has nothing to do with the Lord, but there's so many things that try to reflect on the Lord. And See, if you see His first love, you're going to love Him. If you don't see His first love, you'll feel indebted to Him and you'll try to serve Him. And then you'll weigh your service and you'll think you're lacking. And you'll think you're not a good servant. You're never called to be a servant. Jesus said, I called you friends. He wants you to know Him. He wants to live inside of you. He wants to have a relationship with you. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I'm just holding on. I, I'm barely holding on. And I'm usually not like this. I'm usually wait till I'm alone for this. So I don't know what's going on with me. But I was moved this morning by you guys. The songs, the voices, that young man that was in the middle. I don't know. You could just hear people's hearts when they sing. Just tore me up. Tore me up. <laughs> I was glad you were up there, man. You already messed me up. Now you added him. I don't even know what you're trying to do to me. <laughs> it's not fair. Because <laughs> then I'm supposed to get up here and preach. <laughs> you're messing me up. <laughs> He's beautiful. He's nobody to be mad at. He's nobody to question. He's nobody to raise an eyebrow towards. He's nobody. He was God always. He always was, He always is, He always will be. So He always was God and, and, he's, and He still came and was still God and there's all that fuss about what, what wasn't He still God? Yeah, but, but, but He came as a man. He had to come and be born of a woman like God put Himself inside the womb of a young girl and had to be born like we were born. He did this thing so legal and amazing and he came as a man and he defeated the devil by the grace of God as a man so that he could restore man back to everything he intended that that we shouldn't fight over that we shouldn't be like well you're costing his deity he's still God we nobody said he isn't but he came as a man he took on flesh that that does that sounds like sounds like more than inconvenience but to him I just don't think it was like we can pass a friend's driveway and be five miles down the road and they text us and say, hey, man, are you heading to church? Yeah, I'm almost there. Man, can you swing back and get me? My car just won't start and I don't want to miss it. And we're like, man, I wish you'd have texted me six miles ago. And we'll go get him because he's our friend, but we won't do it without saying how inconvenient it is. It's just, 
he overwhelms me. I'm having trouble. You, you mess me up. <laughs> you have a great voice, but it was your heart that I saw. But your voice is amazing. I don't know what a singer looks like, but I didn't see you as a singer. I don't know what a singer looks like. But man, you got a great voice, but man, you have a great heart. Great heart. You honored him with your song today. And I was having trouble. I want to have trouble. I really do. I want, I want to stay messed up. That, that this is never rhetorical. It's never just okay. Quoting scripture and, and we know what to say. I, I want to be overwhelmed by him. I was very touched this morning together. Thank you for letting me be with you. And honoring him like you did this morning in this house. Guys, if we don't see him as he is, we won't be like him. If we don't have a clear, clear view of him, if we don't see him clear. If we don't see his first love. Our hearts won't respond the way they're designed to respond and we won't love Him. See, we didn't love Him first. We saw that He first loved us. Isn't it amazing how many people struggle with receiving the love of God? That's not an accident. That's a strategy. Just bear with me. I know I feel like I'm not going anywhere maybe, but We'll end up somewhere. I have no clue right now. I'm just, I'm trying to hold it together. I feel emotional. But, 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 but if there's one thing that people struggle with, it's receiving the love of God, believing they can be loved, believing they're lovable, identifying themselves by themselves, through themselves, looking at their own life, weighing their value based on the life they lived instead of the life they were created for. And we don't make that distinguishment. We don't make that change. We just see ourselves for ourselves. For what others have suggested, what others have implied. And not what the cross says. See, you can't find yourself apart from Jesus. You can't find yourself except through Jesus. If you're just looking for somebody to encourage you, you're not encouraged. Somebody ain't going to say it right at the right time. And once they say it, then they got to say it again. And, and every time you get insecure, then somebody has to retouch it and... What a weak way to live. What a deceived way to live. Your life is worth the blood of Jesus to God the Father. Speaks to me of great value, potential, and purpose. It's amazing how you speak that way and, and people have trouble with it. Because no preacher in my life, I didn't know you, but no preacher in my life ever told me growing up that Jesus died to restore a truth in my life. They just said He died because I was a filthy sinner. And they emphasized the filth and the sin. And it's like we come at it from sin and sin and sin. Nobody talked about restoration, redemption, purpose, truth, life in Christ. Being loved by God. And it didn't leave me with the good view of God. I pictured Him hurt, frustrated, upset with me. I figured, you know, He did all this and I can't do nothing about it. I, I'm the same. I got all this stuff in my heart as a young man. I'm looking in my heart. I know what's in there. You can't hide it. And there's stuff in my heart that I know ain't good and I'm listening to sermons, I'm seeing pictures of Jesus hanging on a cross, I'm thinking, I put him there and preachers are telling me I put him there. Okay, I get that. So how do I change? <laughs> Can I change? See, folks left me with the impression that I was stuck. And they were wrong. I'm not stuck. I can't change in my own strength. But the gospel can change me. Grace can change me. His grace is sufficient. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Look at Paul's life. He's changed. Saul is different than Paul. It's not because he did disciplined callous, mental calisthenics, disciplined mind games. He, he was changed by God. And then he wrote of a truth that changed him and got persecuted for the truth. That's what he got whipped for. He got whipped for preaching the answer. It shouldn't surprise any of us. It's a strategy. 
It shouldn't surprise us that people struggle receiving the love of God, but we don't love Him first, we see He first loved us. So if we don't see He first loved us and we struggle with it, we still believe He's God, we still believe it's Jesus came, we still believe we owe Him something. And that's not relationship. That's deception. And you'll never have intimacy with God. You'll never live with an unveiled face. When you're alone, you won't approach Him because you won't feel right with Him. Man, you messed me up, I'm telling you, buddy. Oh. He is so good that I feel silly standing here because I'm trying to fight off emotions because I'm overwhelmed that he's so good, but I don't know quite how to talk about it and get you to see what I'm seeing right now. <laughs> so I'm having a little trouble, sorry. But God sent his son, and that's not old news. That's fresh. Like Jesus came. He didn't just send him, he came. He was born of a virgin girl named Mary. We all know the story. Don't let it just be Christmas. It ain't just a holiday. It ain't something we talk about a couple times a year. Ugh. Like it, it actually is designed to overwhelm me that God would do whatever necessary to, do, to redeem the truth and purpose about why I'm standing here. It's that personal. And then a step farther, that he would then take his own spirit and move in. <laughs> Why? Because he wants to. Because he created me to live in me. And I'm going to struggle with my identity, people stuff, self-consciousness, low esteem, regrets, past mistakes. No! I have a whole new foundation. I have a whole new reason for being. I have a whole new perspective. I have a whole new value. Who I was apart from Him has nothing to do with who I am in Him. Nothing. So now my motives change. My perspective changes. My drive changes. My why changes. Are you with me? Guys, there's, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just talking to a handful of folks. Not everybody tonight I, 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 or this morning. I, I'm just... I'm just stuck on this thing unless I see his first love. I don't love him first. I see. I see. He first loved me. If we don't preach the gospel clear, we won't see the love. We'll see the need. We'll feel convicted, but we won't see the love. Why well, was he yet a sinner? I just know he convicted my heart when I was thinking nothing of him. I wasn't about to do anything for his name. And he's right there convicting my heart. You ever outside of God and you're second guessing, you're convicted, you can't get it out. You're not in the right place. You, I, I remember doing it for years growing up when I stopped going to church. It was almost daily, Pastor. Almost daily I knew, I knew what I was doing. Thought about it. That's the love of God. That's conviction. If he turns that off like brute beast, we just walk off into darkness. If he just turns that off, but he doesn't. His love never fails. He just keeps, hey, psst, hey, psst. I used, to, I used to get so upset with the conviction, I wish it would just go away. It ain't going away. Psst, love you. Psst, hey. There's a higher way. Psst, hey. You don't need to be, psst. He ain't like, I had enough of this kid. He ain't like people. He ain't giving up. He ain't saying, well, if he didn't change by now, he ain't going to change. Well, that boy's worse than he's ever been. Psst, hey, psst, hey. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> you see what's wrong with me? He loves me and he loves you. And somehow I'm supposed to stand here mic'd up and convey that. I'm just having trouble. <laughs> you got to see. You got to see. You can't see what so-and-so said so clear. You can't see what they didn't say. You can't see what you didn't have growing up. You can't see what... You've got to see that God sent His Son. Life starts with Christ. You don't go back and try to mop everything up with Christ. You start with Christ. Dead, start with Christ. You don't go mop things up. You start new. He's new life. 
Non-stop, non-stop. Chris said, yeah, but you know what I've been through. Yeah, but you know what it was like. Yeah, but you don't know the marriage I had. Yeah, but you don't know what my second husband. Yeah, but you don't know what my dad. Yeah, but you don't know what my... Okay. Where's your point? He's here now. Well, you can't mop nothing up. Nobody can change what they said, change what they did. We say we forgive people and we still remember what they did and hold them and we bring it up two years later when we're mad and argue and we say, well, you're the one that... Well, I thought that was over. Well, <laughs> come on, you know I'm telling the truth. And with Jesus, it ain't like that. No matter who you were, what you did, where you were, when your heart says, done with that, don't want to live that another day, I want you, come in. See, that's why just praying a prayer to get blessed and go to heaven and get protected has deception laced through it. No, you're giving Him your life. You're dying so you can live for the first time. You're dying to yesterday. You're dying to the past. You're dying to the childhood. You're dying to all that stuff. It's not, a, oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble. You, it's not about just writing a book of your life and what I've been through. If there's no story of redemption, stop writing the book. It's just another story and we all have one. Look, I could start here, we can go, we can just tell the hell we've been through. We can tell what it was like from little up and all the bad and ugly of what we remember we can buy. Everybody's going to have some level of story. Some are going to be more extreme, some are going to be less, some are going to be intense. And when we're done doing that little survey in this room, this small room, this survey, all we're going to know is who's been through the most hell. And then we're going to sing, it's all about heaven. When we find out what hell we've been through and who's been through the most hell, then the rest of us, the rest of us can't even speak. We don't even have a voice because you don't know what I've been through. You ain't been in my shoes. Who are you to tell me you weren't there? Now we don't even have access. How many people say, well, you can't understand. Well, you don't relate. Well, you never used. I don't have to have ever used heroin to see a heroin addict go free. I've seen a bunch of people go free. I've never been caught up in drugs. I grew up in the city and somehow just stayed away. I saw my dad alcoholic. I said, that's it. I ain't drinking. I ain't doing drugs. I see what it did to our family. And I just actually allowed it to be a learning lesson. I didn't say, well, I drink because my dad drank. No, I don't drink because my dad drank. Well, I just smoke pot because my parents were smoking pot the whole time. So I just smoking pot. Okay, probably a good reason to never smoke pot. It's just crazy the stuff we say and buy into. People tend to struggle with this so bad, don't struggle with this. You won't struggle with this at all. Jesus died on that cross not just to forgive your sins, to pay the price to be forgiven of everything you've done, but restore the very reason why you're alive. And we don't preach it loud. We don't preach it strong. So we're good at trying to get forgiven and getting people to say they're sorry. But we haven't been great at seeing their whole life totally 180 transformed. It's where they never look back and they're no longer Lot's wife stuck between where they've been delivered and where they're supposed to be going. But they're his bride. Dressed in him and by him. Come on, make no mistake about it. The cross is here to redeem your purpose, your potential, and your destiny. It's not here to expose your sin, it's here to remove your sin. So once it removes your sin, you can no longer wear that tag. He doesn't write to the sinners of Ephesus. He doesn't write to those who are about to miss it any moment in Colossae, thank God for the blood. Come on! He writes to the saints. He writes to the holy and beloved. Guys, you've got to put it on. Don't let anybody tell you you can't wear that. It's not works that's going to get you there. You can't go try to live holy to claim holy. You've got to see that He made you something. He put something on you called righteousness. You have to wear that. 
in humility, but boldly. And you have to know that through the blood of Jesus that's speaking better things, you've been washed clean of everything you've ever done, and you are pure in His sight. You're accepted, you're not rejected, you fit perfectly in Him. You've got to wear that. You can't let human insecurity, you can't let past things, what people implied, you can't let what it felt like as a little girl or boy growing up in school and how they mocked and left. You can't let any of that anymore have a voice because that's all a lie. It's a strategy to mark your heart in such a way that when you hear good news, you can't hear it at all. And you're just stuck back here. Man, I wish we'd preach the gospel. I don't know what I'd have done with the gospel. And I'm not mad at nobody, but I don't know what I'd have done with the gospel when I was a teenager if I heard it like I see it. But I don't think, kiddo, I don't think there'd have been a year from 18 to 33 that was just dead. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I grew up feeling like I was, for, I was a forgiven sinner. I was a forgiven sinner. And I'm supposed to stay in church because Jesus is coming back someday. And when he comes back, you better be in church. I was so little when they used to say that. I used to think, wonder if he comes back and it ain't church service. I guess he's only coming when we're having service. I would think that when I was little. He said, you better be in church because if he comes, you ain't in church. And it was just all about doing church instead of being her. Nobody taught me I could be her. They just said me how to tell me I had to go to church. They didn't tell me I could be her. They didn't tell me I was her. Listen, you're the only one. You're the only one that can truly stop you from walking in what he paid for. I, I promise you, you could just believe wrong things and give yourself to wrong things, not guard your heart, not study, show yourself approved, not have a valid, viable. But I promise you, if you seek him, you'll find him. If you draw near, he's right there. Yeah? You can't blame anything on anybody i promise you because god has sanctified and separated us he called us out of darkness you can't at my life right now is, is, is i could i could look to this i could pick up this i could say well yeah i'm just a little down because well they won't just you know i don't know how long i gotta wait i've been praying for them and they just no 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 every day this truth's the same every day the word is the same scriptures have not changed in the middle of my circumstance so why would i change if i'm a believer are you with me? Who believes he's coming someday? Who believes that, that that's really true? That we're just passing through that? It is a wisp and a vapor, a time, boom. We're just going to be changed. So, man, well, listen, I'm not being mean right now. We probably ought to live like we believe that. And we probably ought to stop letting this day and life and all this stuff matter so much and get in turmoil and worrying about tomorrow. He said, today has enough of its own. Stop getting distracted with tomorrow because if you get distracted with tomorrow, today has enough of its own already. You're just going to get overwhelmed, lose your identity, lose your purpose. And you're just going to struggle your way through. And weeks are going to feel like months. And months are going to feel like years. And all of a sudden, life's a dread and a drudge instead of a gift. Don't even think about tomorrow, he said. Today has enough of its own. What's he saying? Nail purpose today. Nail purpose today. In the middle of the trial, nail purpose today. Doesn't mean everything's going lickety split and clean and smooth. Doesn't mean the waters are always calm. Somehow we got this idea in Christianity that we're praying and seas are just going to be calm. We're walking above the clouds, baby. No, you're in the world. You're just not of it. And he says things are coming. There's, there's tr stuff coming. He says, in me you have peace. In the world you have trouble. There's tribulation in the world. But in me you have peace. So be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Wait a minute, Jesus. If you overcome the world, why is there trouble? See, he ain't talking about the trouble going away. He's talking about overcoming trouble and not letting trouble change you, seeing through truth. Jesus brought a mindset, a perspective. He, he brought a way that happens to be the. Yeah? And then he said, follow me. He said, learn of me. Take of me, eat of me. Learn of me. Yeah? It's amazing. In me you have peace. In the world you have tribulation. In me you have peace. Be of good cheer I've overcome the world so he's not talking about it going away he's talking about so he said count it all joy when you're faced with various trials and, and tribulations and things count it all joy why because there's this perfecting in this thing called patience in you Woo! and that thing has great reward it causes you to be mature complete and lacking in nothing 
Why? Because what patience is saying is, I get it. This ain't about me. It's about His great name. I'm done taking it personal. I ain't feeling sorry for myself. I denied myself, remember? I'm not going to feel sorry for what I denied. This isn't about how I feel right now. This is what I see. This is about what I see. And this is about manifesting Christ in the middle of whatever it is. Come on, man, I, I want to see us rise up and live this thing where we're done just calling discouragement normal when the Bible says it's not even Christian. Just defeat it. Just always need a, a prayer pep rally and laying on our hands just to feel encouraged. We should be encouraged if this gospel is preached clear. And we are believers. We should be encouraged. God sent His Son. He called me out of darkness. He put His life inside of me. He forgave me and washed me of everything I've ever done. And I ain't sinning, just waiting to sin, waiting to sin. Sinner waiting to sin, just sinning, waiting to sin so He can forgive me. No, I'm a child of God. His Spirit lives in me. I'm fixed on that and I'm following Him. I'm pursuing to walk in the light as He's in the light as grace empowers me. Yeah, and that means I can love everybody I'm around. That means I can see through God's eyes and see what He beholds. All of a sudden, I have a good view of people, not a bad view of people. All of a sudden, it's not first impressions and handpicking a crowd. All of a sudden, everybody matters. And all of a sudden, I see myself really clear through the cross, and now I got the best look at you I've ever had in my life. It sounds like love God with all your soul, your heart, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbor as your... Well, that sounds a little sketchy. Not a lot of people even like themselves. Wow, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. Two greatest commandments that are married. One's like the other. First one, the second is like it. Love God, love people. Married. As your self. See, it's not an accident that there's so much insecurity and identity crisis. It's not, it's not an accident there's so much low esteem. Because God set this thing up that we see ourselves in Him and through Him, so we see everybody through Him. See, not, not a lot of people in church even like themselves. Let alone love themselves. And they're going to love their neighbor as themselves? Some of your neighbors are saying, hold off on that, pal, till you get a revelation. <laughs> Don't be loving me like you love you. <laughs> Come on, it's serious. We ought to talk about it. If we're going to love God, and we can't love God unless we see His first love, and then we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves, if we don't have this revelation going, now we have a lot of works and mandate and commandment that we're failing. So now we feel like failures. So now we can't approach Him. Now we don't feel clean in Him. Now we feel like failures instead of sons. Feel like we ain't doing what we should be. Ain't where I should be. How many times have I heard that? Well, I ain't where I should be, brother. What, what are you talking about? What, where is that? What? Are you, what? How are you going to get there? How's tomorrow going to be different? I challenge people with that stuff. It's religious. Well, I ain't where I should be. Okay, what are you saying? That's, where is that? See, because if you don't address that and you just say that, tomorrow's always yesterday. And a year from now, you'll be saying, well, I ain't where I should be. And somehow you buy into it. You realize what Jesus came for? He came to redeem the truth about man and why he created man. This is not a passport to heaven. It's a restoration of life. It's a redemption of everything it always was. Don't let anybody try to talk you out of it. This thing, the goal of this thing is not going to heaven when you die. It's living Christ while you live. Being one with the eternal one, which is relationship with God. And of course, we'll live forever because that was God's plan in the first place. He didn't plan that man ever die. He said, Adam, when you eat that tree, it's the day you surely die. Why? Death wasn't in the picture. Till man put it in there. By stepping into what he wasn't supposed to do. So what did Jesus do? He became the problem, sin, on a cross and was made to be sin. So we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. How phenomenal is that? Let's just teach beyond heaven someday. And then we struggle like hell. Till that day comes? No. Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's just a big deal. I'm just telling you this morning, and I'm, I know I was a little emotional. I got up here, I'm still a little emotional. 
He's telling you you're worth the blood of Jesus to God the Father. Your life is worth living. It's impossible that you could be an accident. There's a time to be born. And here you sit. He's the author and giver of life. And life comes from Him. And here you sit. And we're going to believe we're an accident, born at the wrong time, life doesn't matter. Why? Because we're identifying and wearing our value based on facts that are apart from Him. Feelings and emotions, inner thoughts, demonic strategies, just thoughts. Anybody ever get derogatory thoughts? Anybody ever just get demeaning thoughts that just tried to trash you in a strategic way to where you're buying into it and the way it comes, it actually makes sense and you think it's actually you? And the whole time the blood of Jesus is speaking better things, saying, hey, look over here. Hey, you're worth my blood. Hey. And we're like, well, I'm just so, well, I've been thinking and I'm just, and all of a sudden you're, you're graying out and your disposition's changing and all of a sudden there's no light in you. That's how you know you're being deceived. When what you're believing isn't producing life, it's not the Lord. When what you're thinking and what you're believing isn't producing life, it can't be Jesus. He came to give you life and life more abundantly. Why do I talk about this stuff nonstop? Why is it so important? Because that war is going on in people's minds continually. Why? Because he's trying to quench the light. The enemy himself could care less we're having this meeting. He could care less how long we sing. He could care less how sincere we are and how much we cry. He cares if your life starts looking like Jesus and you start responding in the midst of life like Christ and you start walking in the light, showing mercy and making peace and walking in love. He could care less how, how many church services we go to. I, don't, I think Satan sometimes inspires people to go to church. Because we let going to church take the place of knowing Him. And it's a dangerous season in people's lives if they don't get revelation. And we're just, we get shallow with, oh, aren't you so glad they're coming to church? Okay. <laughs> fighting on the way in the car over breakfast still. And already fighting where we're going to eat afterward. And why do you always get to go to your place? Why can't I ever go to my place, praise the Lord? <laughs> I'm just saying, going to church means very little. Now, we're supposed to assemble ourselves together. I'm not saying don't go to church. Don't hear what I'm not saying. What I'm saying is actual physical church attendance means very little if you're not going to live Christ. And it'll become a religious blindness. And you'll let your church attendance identify you as a Christian instead of Christian meaning little Christ-like one. And all of a sudden, we don't even ashamed to say we're Christians. Now we got to say we're disciples. We got to come up with followers of Jesus. We got to change the name because Christians trashed. Ain't that something? It's what they were first called in Antioch because they looked like Jesus. Yeah. Ain't that something? So that's why I talk about this stuff. Because I want us to be legit and real. We talk about life worth shakers and movers and changers of life. That, it's, that's not hype. That's God's intention. Everybody has a sphere of influence. You're not just going to go out and just sock the world in one day, Right? But you have a sphere of influence. You sow seeds. Just be a patient farmer. Just the kingdom of God is of a man scatters seed. Just begin to scatter seed by walking in love. Just carrying the right attitude. You'd be amazed how, how that's just so amazing and how it'll open up your hearing ears and, and your discernment and how just getting up in the morning and being thankful instead of just praying to get through. Not being self-conscious and self-focused, but actually Christ-centered and actually believing your life's a gift and you're on the earth to shine. You'll go to work in a whole different perspective. You'll see your, your supervisor and your co-workers different. You won't be begging God, why didn't you give me a new job by now? Are you punishing me, Lord? That's what people pray. They talk like that to God. They're stuck on their job. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I've been praying to get out of here. The only reason you want to get out because you can't stand the people you work with. That's not the Lord. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Love covers a multitude of sin. Christians shouldn't be changing their job because they can't stand their work environment. Do something about it. People come to me when I pastored full time. It was one of the main requests. Pray for me to get a new job. I can't stand my job. Well, what's wrong with your job? Well, it's my boss and he's so unfair. And the one guy I got to work with, oh my goodness, I just can't stand it. 
I got to get a new job. I feel like I'm being punished working. I say, God, what did I do wrong to deserve this? I'm like, do you realize how self-centered, self-focused and self-conscious you are? Like, this is all about you. No, I'm not praying for you to get that, a new job. I pray God balls you and change you there till you get a revelation. What? Don't, no, pastor, pray. I'd never pray that you get out of there because you'll just be frustrated with your next job and you'll have more people on your despised list and you'll go to church and lead and usher and do something and let that take the place of Christ. I've been that frank and that straight with people my whole life, man. You give me your closed doors and you want to open up your heart and I'm going to hear your heart through your mouth? I'm coming. <laughs> We're going to cut it out, trim it all up, stick it back in, sew it up before we leave. You won't even hurt that much. <laughs> no, it's true. We don't want religion. It's nasty. We know most of us... Especially as spirit-filled folks, we, we like talk against religion, make, but we'd be, be amazed how subtle religion is and how it creeps into people's lives. It's nasty. It doesn't promote Christ. It doesn't manifest Christ. Love does. So love's a big deal. So guard your heart in these last days. You say, well, they've been saying it's the last days. It's been the last days since Jesus rose from the dead. We've been in the last days. This, we're in the era of the last days. So don't count days. Just know we're in the last days. I wonder if it is today. Have you been living for those things that won't rust and rot? Have you been living for those things that are eternal? Have you been living for those things that leave a legacy and bring glory to his name where he'll slip his big majestic hand under your feet and lift you up in the crowd and say, this is my son, Gary. You know, at one time in Gary's life, he could have this and made this decision, but instead he kept his eyes on me. And then when this, and boom, 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 and by the time he's done, just sharing the little testimony of Gary's one life, all of heaven is roaring and on their faces, and Jesus is being exalted. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want that? <laughs> Rather than, here's Gary, you know, uh, he had a hard time, and he had a hard time getting along, you know, with others, and... He was mad for a season and didn't even pray for a while, but I love him anyway and bless Gary's heart, you know. It, <laughs> well, you want to stand before the Lord on that day and let the spouse that you had be greater than who he is. Well, I'd have believed in you if it wasn't for my spouse. I prayed and prayed. Why didn't you change them? No, you're not even going to be able to think that. You're going to be like, oops. And you're going to realize in that moment that you let things matter more than what mattered most. And you let life decide who you are and how you are instead of the giver of it. And your disposition was dictated by circumstances, not the Spirit of God. And purpose and truth. How else do you guard your heart except by truth? Come on, how are you going to guard your heart with all diligence? You're going to protect it in truth. And people that are dear to you and close to you, they're, this is going to be something, Pastor. This is, this is always, you, you've seen this. We're convinced in the church. We believe this. We believe this. We actually, I wish this would change, but we believe the people closest to us have the ability to hurt us the most. But they're the people we say we love. And love takes no account of the wrong done to it. And love doesn't seek its own. So love doesn't get broken like we relate to broken. How many parents in good intention have told the kids, oh, you just broke the heart of God? Well, you just made God so upset? Why do you do those things for the devil? You don't know how mad you're upset you're making God. God's probably crying right now because of you. That is terrible things to tell your children. God is not doing all that stuff your parents told you they, they was. <laughs> he loves. He's not self-focused and centered. He made man in his image and he wants to promote and reveal his image through his people. That's a beautiful, beautiful purpose. Like, you're not a puppet on a string. You're an individual made in a body with a will and God wants to let the beauty and the glory of who He is overwhelm you to where you see it and connect. 
to where all that is his is yours. We're good with that part. All that is yours is yours is mine. But all that is mine is yours. It's covenant, two or one. It's a marriage. It's not, hey, 50-50, do for me, I'll do for you. That's what psychologists tell you. A marriage is I love you. A marriage is all that is mine is yours, and all that is yours is mine, and together we become one to manifest the highest truth. <laughs> We're not trying to get along. <laughs> Come on. I just want you to challenge yourself with some of this stuff. The stuff we've called normal, just little irritable things, stuff that gets on our nerves. No, it's time for every one of us to consider getting new nerves and stop blaming it on the person in your life. Well, they just have a way to rub me. Well, Pastor, you can't tell me people just don't rub you wrong. Run that by God and ask Him if that's true with Him. Because wonder if you were the one that rubbed Him wrong. Wonder if you actually believe you could rub Him wrong. Wonder if you believe He saw you like you see others. Well, you'd never be able to approach Him. You'd never have confidence before God. You see how much of a dilemma wrong thinking is? Do you see how trained we've been by the fall of man? and Adam and being born into Adam and why we must be born again and how much injustice we've done to the power of it by just making it about getting something from him instead of becoming something because of him and all of a sudden I'm just going to heaven now yeah I prayed the prayer hey you saved yeah I'm saved you saved yeah it's born again born again as if you never lived before it's new life through Jesus Christ. It's not a confession. It's an expression. You know them by their... Hello. This is really good. Not my preaching, just the truth of what I'm saying. Because <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kind of crying out. I don't even know what I'm doing this morning. I want to show you something. I... I it just, there, do, who believes there's strategies and things on the earth going on? Who believes there's a, there's a real enemy? Who believes there's a real true God? Who sees that we get to stand in the middle and decide, draw a line in the sand? There's no fence. The devil owns the fence. You're either for him or against him, so there's no fence. You can't, you can't pick middle ground. The devil owns middle ground. You, you, you know that, right? You can't ride a fence. There's no such thing as a fence. You're either for him or against him. You either gather to him or you scatter. Now, he's not talking about not being born again. He's talking about mentality, purpose, motive. Who knows you can see your need for Savior, be forgiven of your sins, and be sincere about being sorry for those sins and never understand or yield yourself to become in love, living by the Spirit, or walking out Christ. And you're a part of a body, but you're not for him, and your mentality is actually working against him. Who knows people were in church. They just want... They want a little bit of authority. They want to be seen. Some people just want to play. Some people want to preach. There's, there's a lot of stuff that happens in churches. It just does. And you're either for Him or against Him. You're either living to promote everything He's here for or you're doing something else, but there's nothing in between. That's intense language. I love that God brings it that clean. You're either for me or you're against me. You either gather to him or you scatter. Do you realize there's somebody that can be sincere, see their need for a Savior, and not connect with God's plan, and actually work against the very plan of God and be in the middle of the plan with a wrong attitude, with a self-centered motive, with just wrong intention? You see? That's why we've got to stay in prayer and stay submitted, stay surrendered, keep our hearts guarded. This stuff is intense. This isn't legalism stuff. This isn't like, oh man. No, this is just sincere. It's just preaching pure heart. Pure in heart will see God. The pure in heart will see God. If we could live with a pure heart, he wouldn't talk about the pure in heart. Why do we actually, some of us, believe that everybody has to have a motive and an intention? And what's he up to and who? To the pure, all things are pure. To the pure, all things are pure. And the pure in heart shall see God. Yeah? Oh, all these scriptures make sense then. Now it all it just makes sense. Oh my goodness, he paid for a life for me to live. Not a place for me to attend. He paid for a life for me to live. 
And the goal of our instruction, we talked about it last night, 1 Timothy 1, 5, is love. The goal of our instruction is love. So if we fail to become love, we fail to fulfill the very reason that he came. That's intent. And we spend years getting better at doing church and never become her. That's intent. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on pastors nowadays. People church shop. People church shop, a lot of circles, a lot of stuff going on. Now, you know, what kind of worship do we have? Do we have the lights? Do we have the smoke? Do we have the this? Do we have this? How long do you worship? Do we have, is it exciting? How many children's programs? How many this? How many that? All of a sudden, people just shirt shopping, church shopping. And they're going to a place that they want to be, that benefits them, that aids and ministers and blesses their family. And it all sounds good on the surface, but it doesn't produce Christ. So then the pastors, if they're not careful, are trying to produce the product they're shopping for. Because we think the attendance is success, but it's lives formed in Christ that's success. It doesn't look, you can have 10,000 people in your church. If you're not walking in love, you're just gathering your community, your social club, whatever you are. If you're not forming Christ in people, it doesn't matter if your church is 12,000 people. It can become religious. It can become a mess. If your goal as a pastor is not forming Christ, if it's just gathering a crowd and, and preaching a sermon where everybody says, that was great, pastor. But there's no transformation of life. They're not producing Christ in people so their Monday is looking like Christ. So they're in fellowship with God and communing with Him. So they're living by the Spirit and walking in love and making peace and showing mercy. All of a sudden, you know you can find your identity in the church you attend? Instead of find your identity in the Christ that lives in you. So this pressure, it's pressure. One of the biggest challenges to a local pastor is, is not turning inward and just trying to do a better service. But continue to focus on forming people in Christ and building people up and living Christ. Keeping that vision in front of people all the time. We become a very religious nation in society. We become warm-hearted and spiritually fuzzy. We let, now I lay me down to sleep and we pray grace over our food and, and we get spiritual at a funeral. Be careful with that. Make sure you wake up and know He loves you. His blood is speaking better things and He washed you and He lives in you and He's with you. And He has empowered your day to walk in the light as He's in the light. And you might not even be excited about your hair texture, the shape of your nose, or the color of your eyes. But it doesn't change the truth. That Christ wants to shine through you. So don't get pressured by these natural things. Don't think you need a new nose to shine. Don't think you've got to crop up your ears a little bit to be more noticeable. Be careful you don't give yourself to frivolous things that are fading away. Just people stuff. Give yourself to Him. He even says to wives, he said, don't, don't, don't try to win your husbands by your outward adorning. The Bible says that. And what are we caught up in? Major outward adorning. What are young girls under the pressure of nonstop their whole young life? Major outward adorning. And you don't have the genetics to fit the magazine pictures. And you don't even have a chance. Now you have to somehow cope and handle. Your heart either gets hurt, you get introverted, you get hard, you get angry, or whatever. <sighs> You can tell it's all a lie because of what it produces. And I cry over this stuff more than you know. I hurt for young girls because of that one thing I just said right there because I've pastored and I've held too many and I've seen too many believe in wrong things because they're pressured by the statement of life instead of Christ. And they're just not secure in Christ. I need to look a little different. Maybe if I do this with my hair. Maybe if I just this. Maybe if I wear this. For what? What's that going to change? P Peter said, husbands, don't let your husbands be won by just your outward adorning. Don't even think it's your outward adorning. Look, it's, it's that quiet, gentle, inward person of the heart which is pleasing and pleasurable to God. Why wouldn't you want that? <laughs> wow. Probably should want that. Yeah? Man. I just know it's true. I've seen people worship God from the heart. You did it this morning, man. 
It has nothing to do with his appearance. It has nothing to do with him being a man or a lady. I heard his heart coming out of his song. And I looked at him, and he had this gentleness and humility on his face. I just was looking, and I didn't want to distract him because he was off and running. But I just thought, I better not stare at him too long. But I was fixed on you, dude. I was like, oh, my goodness. I got touched, man. It had nothing to do with, is he handsome? Isn't he handsome? To me, it was so glorious. I'm like, you don't even see that thing. You, you just see his heart. You see Christ. You ever see a lady doing that? You ever see a lady just singing the Lord? And she just is, truly loves the Lord. She's just singing it. It's so beautiful, but it's clean. It's just a pure beautiful. It's not a lusty beautiful. It doesn't even matter about her hair color, her eyes, her makeup, nothing. It's just you can see it on her face, her love for God, and the truth of what she's singing. And it's like, sometimes I do that. I look around. I, I'm not distracted by it. I think, I think, I think the Lord looks around. I, I, I'm in a worship service sometimes. I'll just go over and see a young girl, and I'll be like, oh, my goodness. I saw this little child up here kneeling, and I was just like, I'm just about done already. And then she comes up, and she's standing, sitting here kneeling at the altar. And I'm like, oh, I just pay attention. I, I see a lot. <laughs> and I'm blessed by it all. <laughs> it gets me half a wreck. <laughs> Amen. Let me read this one thing and we'll just close. It's just a teaching, encouraging time. Listen, there's nothing I'm preaching and saying that you can't give yourself to. There's nothing I've said you can't live by faith. You take out every factor of your life, every challenge and every situation, you just take it all away. There's nothing I said that in the midst of all that you can't live, no matter what you're in the middle of. You say, yeah, but you don't know who I'm married to right now, but I know who lives in you. I know what you're created for and what you're called to. Why are you letting who you're married to trump what you're created for? Come on, this insecurity thing's bigger than we think. We're finding identity through things and people. Social media scares me sometimes. It's, so, it's such a monster. It can be used for glory and good and God, but it's used for so much damage and detriment. There's people just looking for esteem. There's people out there just looking for praise. There's people just looking for an ounce. Just, they just, they're just counting thumbs up. But the problem is if they got thumbs down and now they're counting and now, oh, no, I got thumbs down, but I'm, I need the thumbs up. But, oh, and then it just crushes and it's just weird stuff. People are looking for attention and looking for praise. It's the wrong way. It's just it, it's some of the social media stuff. Be careful with that stuff. I usually don't preach that from the pulpit. I don't get on a tangent too much with that. I'm very concerned about the whole social media thing out there. It seems all consuming. Christians seem consumed by it. Consumed by it. Be careful. As something's not right. Something doesn't feel healthy. Just be careful. That you're not drawing something that's counterfeit, that's taking the place of what's real. Don't fill gaps with putty when you could be firm on the rock of Christ. You know what I'm saying? Because that putty's going to crack. Yeah, you're going to have to redo the walls in a couple of years. <laughs> it should just get fixed for life, eh? I want you to look at something in Matthew real quick with me. I want you to see how important love is and how, how much of a strategy is. So, so what time is it, man? Because I don't want to go crazy late. We come at, what is it? Oh, Lord Jesus. I wanted to be done by now. I probably ought to stop. No, I really should. No, we're coming back at like 6 o'clock. <laughs> Let's do this real quick. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, do you understand we're in a demon war against the kingdom of God? Do you understand that? Do you understand that a third of heaven wiped out and that Satan got cast out? Do you understand that he's angry, he's upset, he's selfish, he's full of pride? He's trying to make people after his image. So he's trying to be God. He's going to rise above. He's going to sit above. He's going to be above God. That's, what he's, that's his decree. His decree is he's going to be God. So he wants to rule you right here. And he wants to get you to think like him, to believe like him, to react like him. Like when a, when a Christian, a sincere Christian, just has outbursts of anger and wrath, it's like a charismatic worship service in the wrong direction. That's what the Lord told me a long time ago. He said, Dan, I want you to see how serious this is and how strategic. Every time you would do this, he said, it's, just a, it's a charismatic expression in the wrong direction. It's a small g. 
Yeah. See, the most beautiful form of worship isn't found in a song, in an atmosphere. It's found in a life that's lived surrender. It's, it's a life that's lived in Christ. It's the most beautiful form of worship you're ever going to find. It's somebody that's just walking in love, not taking account of any suffer wrong, and overcoming every harsh word with a kind word, and overcoming evil with good. It's the highest worship you're ever going to see is somebody following him. Following him. Are you with me? We can follow him or he wouldn't have invited us. Yeah? It's not just the songs we're singing. It's the life we're living. So we're in a demon war against the kingdom of God. You got darkness trying to defeat light. So he knows he can't stop God. He can't just go in and knock him off his throne. He knows that. He actually knows he's doomed and damned. Spirits fell on their faces before Jesus and fell down on their knees and said, Oh, my goodness, it's you. They saw he was in a man. He was the man, Jesus. And they came up to him like, who's this guy? They've knocked off prophets. They've killed, stole, destroyed for generations. Killing's always the answer. But they're coming to Jesus. They're stirring up the heat and the people and they're working. And they come and, and, and Jesus happens to go by these two spirits. And what do they do? Manifest, fall on the ground and say, it's you. Have you come to torment us before our time? What a dead giveaway. That they absolutely know they can't stop the Lord. They're totally defeated and totally crushed, but they believe they can get you to fear them, get worried about and worry for your own life, and make it all about now instead of that day, and just get distracted and just get caught up in the, even the, 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 the ooh of the devil. Are you here to torment us before our time? What are they saying? There's nothing we can do to stop what you've proclaimed. So what's their only answer? To stop what God wants to do through us. And stop us. What's the whole goal of God? Seed time and harvest time. Each, each tree after its own kind. Each seed after its own kind. So God wants to reproduce and multiply himself again and again and again. So the enemy says, okay, I'll undertake that goal. And I'll try to reproduce myself again and again and again. Through his man. So what's he do? He comes in and he slips in and he uses words and intellect and analytical and he deceives Eve. People say, well, I'm just analytical. Okay, you should have stopped that yesterday. Analytical is not a gift. It's not from the Lord. God never gave you the gift to make something so complex you can't see it. He never gave you the ability to talk yourself out of Him by thinking long enough. Analytical is not from the Lord. People pride themselves. Well, I'm just very analytical. I'm a thinker, okay? How about living out of your heart? Look, you can tell an analytical person God loves them and they'll come up with some reason why he might not by thinking hard enough. That's not a gift. That's what happened to Eve. And the more the other voice suggested and the more the other voice spoke, the more Eve considered. Hmm, hmm, hmm. She was deceived. Adam did a different thing. He heeded the voice of his wife instead of God. What happened? That means Eve spoke what she heard to Adam. He heeded the voice of his wife. Because you've heeded the voice. People say, yeah, but the Bible says Adam was there in the garden with her when the serpent... It doesn't say that he heard the conversation and they were side by side. But it does say, because you heeded the voice of your wife instead of me. What's that tell you? Eve got deceived and became a spokesman. For the deception became the first disciple of the lie and multiplied it in her husband. And then every man that was born after that was born into that lie. And Satan sitting back cocked up, he's winning. He strolls in in the book of Job. He literally has arrogance. He strolls in to the presence of God. He's in line. He says, where are you coming from? He said, oh, I'm just to and fro here and there. He said, he said, have you considered my servant Job? 
Why is he even asking the devil that? Because there's this thing going on. And God made man with a purpose and intention. He said, have you considered Job? He's not like any other man. He's different. And he says, Job, different than any man. He's like anybody else. He says it right to God in Job. He says the only reason he's the way he is because you made him fat in the land. You hedged him on every, every corner and protected him. You protected him on every side. No wonder he blesses you. You've blessed him. He said, you take away the blessing. Watch. He said, you take away the blessing from Job, he will curse you to your face just like everybody else will. What's he saying to God? He said, people don't love you. People don't love you. They need you. And if you give them what they want, they'll seem like they're on your side. You take the candy out of their hand and they'll scream and squeal and kick their feet on the floor. People don't love you. They're all like me. That's what he's saying in the book of Job. <sighs> Job loses everything. He don't curse. He comes back the second time. He said, have you considered Job? He hasn't cursed me, even though he lost all these things. He says, skin for skin. The devil took God. Skin for skin. A man will give anything to save his own life. What's he saying? I've watched man for years and years now. I've got them all figured out and they're all the same. They say all this stuff, but when it comes right down to it, every man's for himself. What's the first thing a Christian's supposed to do? Deny him. He didn't say pray a prayer to go to heaven. He said deny yourself. What else did he say? Pick up your cross. What's that mean? That means walk through every adversity, taxi through every trial. That means when sin is done against you, don't repay it with sin. Don't let sin against you give the right to produce sin in you, overcome evil with good. Don't ever repay it. Carry your cross. Because unless you deny yourself and carry your cross, you'll never follow Jesus. You can go to church, you can serve in a ministry, you can feed the hungry, and you can go on a mission trip. But until you deny yourself and pick up your cross, you're not following Jesus. Because somewhere your heart will get exposed. Somewhere you have a fallout in another ministry story of how you were all invested and all involved and how they betrayed you and how you don't even go anymore because people can't be trusted and da-da-da-da-da. And 25 years later, it's still your story. Oh, I'm getting real right now. And it's all because we don't know him like we sing. And I'm saying, come on, we can. Nothing I'm saying is mean and mad and bad. It's calling us out of this thing that deceives us. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I want to become what he paid for. <laughs> Come on, if you paid a high price for something and it didn't do what you paid for, you take it back. Thank God he didn't take us back yet. <laughs> take us to the Redemption Reclamation Center. Take us in there and get us redeemed. Well, what'd you pay for this? I paid the blood of my son. You paid the blood of your son for this? You fool, you shouldn't even, you ain't getting nothing back. I don't know what you was thinking. Well, no, 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 I didn't see what you're seeing. I see something else, see? See, he knows what he paid for. See? Jesus ain't take none of us back. Try to get his money back. Here's the other thought about the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, for one thing, the same price was paid for every man. That means everybody has the same value to walk in his image, to walk in his love, to walk in the light. Come on, we haven't believed that in the church. We don't believe everybody has the same value. We believe there's people higher than others, lower than others. We think there's people that are just insignificant. There's individuals that believe they're insignificant. Sometimes people take on the posture of insignificant because they've learned it draws a weird kind of attention. So when they come across low, people try to say, oh, no, you're awesome. Some people serve in a ministry just to get appreciated. I've learned all this along the way. I've seen it all. That's why people get so hurt serving in churches and leave the church because nobody appreciated them. Well, I served over there. They didn't seem to care too much. Well, you shouldn't have been serving to get accolade. You should have been serving because of love for the kingdom, for his name's sake, to lay down your life. If you're expecting thanks, then no wonder you're failed in expectation. There's a lot of people served in ministry that don't go to church anymore because it wasn't a good experience for them. But it was their motive in serving. Are you following me? Come on, this stuff needs realized. It saves us from doing it again and again and again and again. Yeah? I wanted to read. I'm so late. I got to stop. I'm just stopping. You got plenty. You, listen. No, I'm, I'm stopping. 
I'm stopping. I'm coming back tonight. You might not even be here if I keep going, see? No. You got plenty. It's just teaching. I'm just stirring your heart. I'm just, listen, nobody can walk this out for you but you. You guard your heart with all diligence. It's out of your heart flows issues of life. You make peace with God through the blood of Jesus. Make peace with all men. Don't look back. Look up. Keep on going. Don't let what people don't see become your vision. Don't let how somebody's treating you become how you are. Don't let what one man did or is doing decide who you are unless it's Jesus. Yeah? Listen, man, everybody can turn on me. All you guys could say, look, we're following something crazy and fake. I still got to answer, what am I going to do with my conviction? How am I going to live out Jesus? I can't just jump in the basket and say, well, everybody else is giving up. I still got to deal with my conscience. I still got to live with my heart. I still got my own mindsets and my own things that come, my own convictions. Look, my whole family could just drop off the deep end and, and, and say, look, we're done with Jesus. I still got to answer, what am I going to do with him? Boy, I wish we would get that and just become diligent soldiers that have intimate relationship and love. Not just robots. Christians. Yeah? Soldiers of the Lord. No longer, no longer, no longer entangled in the affairs of this life. Enduring hardship because they're good soldiers. People that are surrendered and committed that truly understand. Makes me feel like I want to read Matthew, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Do me a favor because I can't stop. I, I don't know what's wrong. Just stand up. Stop looking at me. Look at the wall or something. Look at the ground. Do something, but stop looking forward. Let's pray something. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to go this late. We started late, late though. We started late. You guys worshiped and stuff. It was so good. Usually on a Saturday morning, they just tell me to jump up and preach. You guys, thank you for what you invited us into this morning. Is that right? I mean, who, who experienced that with me? That was, that was rich. That was like worship. That was like exalting Him, like who He is was in the room. Phew. Don't let your feelings, your emotions, don't let any mindset talk you out of this. You're worth the blood of Jesus Christ, friend. You're worth the blood that He shed to God the Father. See, see nobody ever told me that nobody pays a high price for nothing. Like nobody ever com connected that to the Gospel. Holy Spirit taught me that in the bedroom. I started to realize... Oh my goodness, you paid a high price. Nobody pays a high price for nothing. So my life must be able to be something outside of what it is. So every, every pastor in my whole life growing up told me Jesus died on the cross because I was a sinner. Nobody, nobody made it clear to me and said, listen, he had to die because of your sin. Your sin cost him his life. So he had to die to take care of sin. But the goal of him dying wasn't because you're a sinner. It's because your destiny was lost. Your purpose was lost. Your creative value was lost in sin. So he wanted to redeem and restore the truth about why you're here in the first place. So he died on the cross to put life back inside of you. See, if they'd have told me that when I was a teenager, that would have made more sense. Then I would have started to understand. Instead, I'm just fighting this war against sin that I can never defeat. And all of a sudden, I realize he defeated it. Are you with me? Come on, guard your heart, church. Let's follow Jesus, right? Let's deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. Just think how many pastoral appointments would be canceled. Tell me if I'm telling the truth. Ninety-some percent of Pastoral appointments are people struggling with people or people struggling with life. Just think how many counseling appointments would be ended. <laughs> I've never minded counseling appointments. It's just an opportunity to share truth, but you've got to want truth. Don't let yourself get tricked into self-centeredness. Feeling sorry for yourself. Biggest trap on the planet. Loneliest party you've ever been to. The only people that draw close to you that you draw close to you in that moment or people that seem to care about how you feel but that doesn't change you yeah please don't let yourself feel sorry for yourself look you can lose a loved one you can lose a spouse most of us especially us when your hair gets this color you, you you're not you're not just preaching you know what you're saying you can't let that stuff matter more than what you're created for you guys see it all in the eye of faith and in truth. And you can't let anything be
discouraging and defeating in your life. You just can't turn inward and feel sorry for yourself. It's, it's a trap because you denied yourself. Are you all with me? It's important. It's huge. The reason I cry this stuff out because I pastored for a little while and I've talked to tons and tons of people along the way. And people pull me over sideways and they're all around. They say, hey, look, they watch me and they want to pour out their hearts. They email me and they want to counsel and questions. And when I read some of the stuff, I'm like, they say, I listen to you all the time. And then when I hear what they're writing, I'm thinking, are they listening? I'm like, what? So I get, I just got, I just have this passion and heart cry in me like, come on, guys, we can live this way. Don't think it's unreachable. Grace will take us there. Amen? Amen. Will you do something with me? Will you just be willing and sincere about becoming what you're hearing this morning? And I'm just going to pray a corporate prayer and just believe there's grace on it. Can we do that? So, Father, we just thank you right now for your amazing love. We just thank you for the statement of the cross. Let it be way, way bigger than heaven someday and way, way bigger than, God, you forgave me of my sins, even though that is incredible. We're not making light of that. The forgiveness of sins is vital and huge, and it's what clothes us in righteousness. So we thank you for that, but we embrace purpose and destiny, and we take a bigger step to step into everything you paid for, everything that your grace is saying we can become. And I'm asking, Lord God, that right here in this region, right here in this room, You begin to form Christ in us and form the church of Jesus Christ. Like the most healthy, beautiful, uh, undebatable expression that we've ever seen, God. That people would just begin to live Christ and walk in love and live by the Spirit. Lord God, I just thank you that our lives would be built on consistency in the truth. And that men would even be won over by just the unwaveredness of our life. Just the consistency of our life. That we see what we see and we become what we see, God. I just thank you that no longer would they just see weakness and then... windows of strength and weakness and windows of strength but God let us set an example to the world around and even our fellow believers of what Christ looks like in people I ask for that grace today that we would become love that we would walk in love and that we would really truly live by your spirit and God I thank you for healings I do I thank you for miracles I thank you for all the great things but let us not just be tickled by that and impressed by that or just just look at the let us let us let us make the main point the main point And let everything you do flow out of this beautiful truth. So God, we thank you for all the healings. We thank you for last night. We thank you for even people today that are just finding strength in their bodies, pain-free living, and just the restoration of things. In fact, Lord, right now I just bless joints and bodies and, 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 and just... Just ligaments, Lord. I just see some joints and ligaments and just some mobility, God, being touched and changed and healed. In the name of Jesus, sharpness in hearing and sharpness in eyesight. You touched some eyes last night. I thank you you continue as you're doing it in the spirit, God. I thank you you're doing it in the natural, that you're changing eyes, Lord God. Father, I speak to organs in the authority of Jesus' name. I speak to livers and hearts, Lord God, and kidneys. And thank you that in this room, they're functioning well. Functioning well. I'm speaking to kidneys right now, God, and I thank you that they function well. Who's, who's having, is there somebody having issues in the room? I can't get kidneys out of my mind for some reason. Kidneys, you having trouble? Come out here. I just can't get it out of my mind. And I felt like, Lord, that's a word. We got to just pray for somebody. Yeah, I'm telling you, they're going to be changed. In the name of Jesus, changed. I need a young lady. Come here, come here. Put your hands right where her kidneys would be. She won't mind, you're a lady. In the name of Jesus, complete wholeness. Father, I thank you today, now, those kidneys changed because you're good. It's so good. And Father, let your love just rest upon her. And I see God doing something right here in your mind. Just making your mind solid. Uh, Your mind's not going to spin. I see something just where you've even just said some things about your own mind. But your mind's blessed. Your mind's blessed. And I see God locking in your thoughts and your beliefs. And see, he's going to teach you how to live out of your heart. Because your heart is amazing. I see your heart like fine gold. And the only attack point that Satan would ever have, honey, is right here in your mind. I just see God teaching you how to live out of your heart and let your heart overtake your mind. So don't second guess. Don't ever live condemned. Always look to your heart. If you feel bad about something, it's because there's purity inside and you care. Don't ever, ever, ever live condemned or ashamed ever in your life. You are God's girl. You're a prize to him. He bought you and he won you over with his love. And he's doing a work, I'm telling you straight up and bold, he's doing a work in your kidneys. And ain't nobody can do nothing to stop it. That's amazing. Father, thank you for your great love for people in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.
Amen. Amen. Do one more thing with me. Would you lift your hands high to him and just as a sign of surrender and yieldedness, just, just like we're vessels of clay. That's all. We're just vessels of clay. Just mold us, shape us. Do this in your own heart. Tell him this is true. Don't just do this because pastors close out the service and say, okay, I need to raise my hand. No, raise your hands to him. Say, I yield to you. Man, I'm the clay. You're the great potter. Make me what you see. Make me what you always intended. Shape me and mold me. And when you take off that tarp, ta-da, masterpiece, God, made in your image. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. Vessels of clay transformed, God, into vessels of honor for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Sorry I got so late. Pastor, whoever wants to close out, I'm just stopping. Sorry.